blood pressure as dr dheeraj said it is a very very important problem or a disease which needs treatment at the right time and it has to be picked up early because if we don't treat the blood pressure in the early stages of life or early age of one person then it can lead to damage inside the arteries of the heart kidneys of the heart and he has already described every almost every organ can get affected if we don't treat high blood pressure hello friends and greetings from vlcc and a very good evening to all of you i am dr anju kai vice president and head preventive healthcare at vlcc your host for the session today and uh, with me are uh, co panelists uh, um we are going to have dr praveen chandra shortly and he is the india's leading interventional cardiologist and we have now with us eminent cardiologist dr dheeraj bhatia and nutrition expert dr deepthi verma and each of whom you will meet shortly about vlcc now vlcc with 310 locations in 143 cities across 12 countries in south asia southeast asia gcc region and east africa it's it's a leader in beauty and wellness arena and our wellness program is recommended by ima the indian medical association and uh, this webinar uh, it's part of our monthly webinar series our educational contribution to holistic wellness and we do this with quality information and healthy lifestyle choices so yes uh, i'm sure we we have all heard someone complain oh you know i have bp you know what if you have bp or blood pressure you are actually lucky because it's proof that you are alive if you didn't have bp we would have been really worried yes so on a serious note the question is not if you have bp or not but whether it's higher or lower than it should be right so low bp is hypotension and uh, higher than normal is hypertension and that is what is the subject of this webinar hypertension so high blood pressure uh, you know uh, the general feeling is that it's for oldies it doesn't just happen to older adults nearly one in four adults aged 20 to 44 have high blood pressure and it is estimated that a third of india's adult population is diagnosed as hypertensive and if we you know if we if we add up the undiagnosed numbers so it will go as high as 50% and the, the surprising thing is the prevalence is higher among women so what is this blood pressure actually what happens is as our heart beats it pushes the blood into the arteries which carry the blood to other parts of our body blood pressure is the pressure of the blood pushing against the walls of our arteries and this pressure is measured in millimeter of mercury we call it as mm of hg you must have read that right so when the arteries when they are narrowed or constricted or blocked they create more resistance to blood flow requiring the heart to push harder raising the blood pressure so over the long term this increased pressure can cause various health issues including heart disease and that we'll be talking about and that's what we want to prevent so uh, going forward about bp bp or blood pressure uh, is spoken about as two numbers you you know that yeah it's like 120 by 80 130 by 90 or etc you know so we we have two numbers a higher and a lower number the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure the top number represents the pressure when your blood is pump from the heart to your arteries this is the systolic blood pressure and the bottom number represents the pressure when your heart is at rest that is between the beats and this is the diastolic blood pressure so 
what is what is the normal blood pressure? Uh, the recent protocol says that for adults, a systolic reading of below 120 mm of Hg and a diastolic reading of less than 80 would indicate that you have a healthy heart and cardiovascular system, but there is a healthy range. Uh, it cannot be too low below 120 and 80. So the range is 90 to 120 for systolic and 60 to 80 mm of Hg for diastolic. So that's the normal blood pressure we all should aim for, right? So medically, uh, you know, uh, we, we consider hypertension in five levels or five grades, you know. The first one, of course, is the normal we talked about. Uh, and the next level, it is called elevated blood pressure. When your systolic blood pressure reads from 120 to 129, nearly 130, and diastolic pressure reads less than 80. So that is the elevated uh, blood pressure, uh, hypertension. And uh, that's, that's the one which so many people have and it goes undiagnosed, you know. So the third level is called the stage one hypertension. And when the systolic pressure reads between 130 to 139 mm of Hg and diastolic pressure reads between 80 to 89 mm of Hg. So this is the stage one hypertension. While stage two hypertension means that there is minimum of 140 by 90 mm of Hg, 140 systolic and 90 mm of Hg. That's minimum and it goes higher and higher and higher till it reaches the hypertension crisis. When the systolic pressure reads way above 140 mm of Hg and diastolic pressure reads above 120 mm of Hg. And this is very high and this is an emergency. So like I said, we have elevated uh, hypertension, we have stage one, stage two, and hypertension crisis. Of course, the normal one is there. Now, time to address your questions. We can see uh, we have received a lot of questions from you. You have been sending it to us. And so I will invite our panel experts to do so. And I'm really delighted to welcome and introduce to you our first panelist for today, Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia has over 35 years of clinical consultancy practice in New Delhi and has been a senior consultant cardiologist with Fortis Escorts Heart Institute and Research Center and Max Super Speciality Delhi. Actually, he's been honored twice by DMA and IMA as the Doctor of Excellence awardee, and his professional interest areas are prevention and treatment of pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, of course, ischemic heart disease, and obstructive sleep apnea. In fact, he has been part of the core medical research team, which had laid down guidelines for defining the management of obesity and PCOS in nations. And he has also been the senior medical advisor to VLCC for the last 20 years. Good evening, Dr. Bhatia, and welcome to the webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. So let me start uh, with the first question from our audience. What are the common symptoms of hypertension if left untreated and what are the possible complications that may happen? Good evening, um, everybody. And good evening, uh, Dr. Anju, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, let's set the ball rolling straight away. Uh, symptoms of hypertension is very interesting that they've asked this question because Actually, in 90% of individuals, there are no symptoms, absolutely no symptoms. And that's the reason why it is called a silent killer. So hypertension is actually divided into two very broad groups. One is what we call as essential or primary hypertension, which means hypertension with no cause. And that is about 90% of the population. 10% falls into secondary hypertension. Now, secondary hypertension, the common causes are, like if one has taken certain medications, like steroids, 
non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like anti-inflammatory drugs, biggest culprit, combiflam, brufen, diclofenic, Wovaran. So these Advil in the US. So these drugs are notorious for increasing your blood pressure for many reasons, primarily because of sodium and water retention. Similarly, in the old days, we used to see a lot of patients, young women, who are on oral contraceptives, and they used to land up with hypertension because of the estrogen component. But now the estrogen component is very, very low. So we see it, but we see it rarely. Antidepressants, not a very big group. Steroids, not a very big group. So very important to first take a history, rule these out. Then, of course, secondary, you can have because of tumors, uh, like in the adrenal gland, which is next to the kidney, you have an adrenal tumor, or you could have something called Cushing syndrome, where the body makes excessive cortisol. But let's not go there. Let's go what is common. So commonly, what we find is primary hypertension or essential hypertension, that is hypertension with no cause. You may only pointer maybe a family history of hypertension. Therefore, it's very, very important to take that family history. So if you will have it, may not have it in the parents, but then you can have it in the brothers, sisters, grandparents. So we go all the way up, grandparents. And therefore, that gives us one, one idea. Now coming to the major symptoms, like I said, 90% no symptoms. But then there are some pointers and you need to be careful. One of the commonest is headache. Now, headache is not the usual headache. You know, frontal headache is like a sinus headache. If you get pain here, we say, okay, there's a ear infection. Uh, you could also get pain around the eyeballs. And then you say your vision, you know, get to, go to ophthalmologist and get your vision tested. So here the pain is usually uh, in the ears and it's kind of a throbbing kind of headache. And unlike migraine, which is unilateral, this is both sides, bilateral. Very often they have pain at the occipit area, at the back, especially in the morning time. So they'll wake up the patients and say, we're getting a heavy head here. And now mind you, a headache has many causes, but this is one of the primary. Another thing is they get a funny sensation in the ear, like a, not really a pain, like a vibration, a reverberation. And they actually say that we feel as if you're in water and our eardrums are kind of moving, you know. So that's another very peculiar kind of pain which you get. So there are a lot of these things which come in. Uh, other symptoms are like breathlessness. Then they start having, you know, um, epistaxis, which is bleeding from the nose. Then they can have blurring of vision. And then they can have, you know, symptoms of the complication. Like you, you start, you know, start getting angina where the blood flow is decreased. Or if uh, you may have severe chest pain and myocardial infarction, that means a heart attack, because what has happened is that there has been a rupture. There has been a rupture of the calcification in the blood vessel of the heart. So that's another important. Or you can have uh, symptoms of complications like, you know, impending stroke. So person comes to you and starts, his BP is very high. And he says, oh my God, ma'am, uh, sir, doctor, I'm having this since, you know, this, uh, this problem of speech, slurring of speech, or blurring of vision, or weakness in one particular part of my hand. So, you know, there, there is a wide um, spectrum. And I think the key is to just be very careful, take a very good medical history. And, uh, you know, whether it is breathlessness or chest pain or blurring of vision, kidneys can be affected too. And they can start, you know, chronically, if they go into a chronic kind of a situation failure, then they start passing more urine initially before the urination becomes less and the urea creatinine go up. So that is, uh, it's not necessarily always diabetes, which causes excessive urine. You could have early renal failure. So these are the common symptoms, which we usually find. And really, you know, we've seen patients with very severe backache. And why? Because the aorta, which is the main, main artery, which comes from the heart, that starts becoming like an aneurysm because of high BP, that enlarges. And there can be a slight tear inside, and that causes very severe backache. So that's called aortic dissection, a deadly complication. So we need to be, you know, or there can be complications of cardiac failure where the swelling of the feet, breathlessness, so wide variety. But anyway, commonly you should keep this in mind. Headache is very important. Bleeding from the nose is important. Breathlessness is important. Little chest pain is important. The swelling of the feet is important. To summarize, these are the common ones. And Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. I think we'll come back to you in a short while, Dr. Bhatia. But, and we look forward to a lot of demonstration and right way to check blood pressure at home and very many other useful facts because I want to bring in our special guest for the evening, Dr. Prabhu.
Arvind Chandra. He's just come out of his uh, uh, operation theater. And uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Praveen Chandra, for giving us the time. Let me just introduce uh, Dr. Praveen Chandra. He's a leading Indian cardiologist and chairman of interventional cardiology at Medanta Med City Gurgaon. And he's recognized as one of the leaders in angioplasty in the country and has a number of innovative devices, technologies and procedures first to his credit. He was awarded the Padma Shri in 2016 by President of India for success and achievement in the field of medicine. And he has also served as Director of Cardiac Cat Lab in Acute MI Services at Max Healthcare and Consultant Cardiologist at Escorts Heart Institute and Research Center. So he has published approximately 100 articles, reviews, and abstracts in various national and international journals. And he's been awarded the prestigious recognition award for success and achievement in the field of angioplasty in India in 1998. Wow. Welcome, Dr. Chandra, and it is such an honor to have you with us today. So uh, uh, let me start with a question from our attendees to you. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so what is the first line of medical treatment for a young hypertensive with elevated blood pressure, just about, say, 130 by 90, who discovers it while uh, his annual checkup? You know, so they get... Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's a very important thing because uh, blood pressure, as Dr. Dheera said, it is a very, very important problem or a disease which needs treatment at the right time and it, it has to be picked up early because if we don't treat the blood pressure in the early stages of life or early age of one person, then it can lead to damage inside the arteries of the heart kidneys of the heart and he has already described every almost every organ can get affected if we don't treat high blood pressure. So now how do we know that somebody has a high blood pressure? He has already told that there could be some symptoms but there may not be some symptoms so which means that every person should have a blood pressure checked once in a you know year at least and because blood pressure can start happening from early age can start happening from middle age so if someone, someone doesn't have a blood pressure at 35, it doesn't mean that he will not have blood pressure at 38 or 40. So that means every year blood pressure has to be checked. Now, once we find that the blood pressure is above the level of 140, 90, then that means we are, you know, bells start ringing. But still it is no panic, nothing, because we have to check it again. So blood pressure has to be checked at least a few times before we really start the medication. Because many, many times, if you get to the hospital or, you know, the bigger the hospital is, the higher the blood pressure goes. That's what we call. So you can check your blood pressure. If in the hospital is high, nothing to worry, no rush to treat. You can check the blood pressure at home. So that is why we now rely on home BP measurements. If on the home BP also, on consistent sits you know uh, times it is found to be high in the range of 140 90 and above that is the time when we have to start thinking of starting some treatment now what treatment the question is so the first treatment is no medication the first treatment is reducing the salt intake if it is high reducing alcohol intake now today in our life the alcohol uh, alcohol is actually a, a very you know socially accepted thing. I mean, people don't feel that the life is vibrant unless until they take alcohol. So that is something which is there, and you know, in every uh, get together, every home, people have started consuming more alcohol, and that is leading to more high blood pressure. Okay. So the first thing is to reduce alcohol or stop alcohol, reduce salt intake, reduce you know, foods which are containing high salt content. For example, if somebody is taking you know, food outside home, like you know, going to restaurants almost uh, every alternate days or taking pizzas or taking you know, anything which is more salty, 
is lead, leading to high blood pressure. So reduce that. Third, start walking or doing some kind of a physical activity. Relaxation. Mental stress is also one of the causes of high blood pressure. And many times we see, we ask the patient when they come, are you stressed? Are you having any problems? And, uh, you know, have, has there been anything which is troubling you? In those situations, we have seen that the blood pressure goes up. So we have to control all that first, which means the first step is to control the lifestyle. Okay. Then you do all that for about two weeks or three weeks. If the blood pressure gets controlled with that, no need for medicines. Okay. And many times people are not sleeping well. That's leading to high blood pressure or there is stress in the family. For example, you know, this COVID time, you know, a lot of people were getting sick, very, very sick. That is the time when the pressure was going up. So uh, these are the things first we have to control all that. And once the blood pressure is controlled on that, no need to take medicine, just regular BP checkup. Right. But if the blood pressure doesn't get controlled on all this, then we have to start medications. Right. Right. So, uh, Dr. Chandra, there are so whole load of these medications and so many of so many combinations, so many chemical uh, uh, constituents and all that. So people get so confused as to uh, whether what is the kind of medicine I should be taking and how how do we uh, sort of uh, fix up and uh, decide that this is what has to be given because there's so many of them available. Yeah. So the medicines, mostly the medicines are quite effective. And uh, there are few medicines. Uh, I can take, take the names of some of these medications, like telmisartan, like amlodipine, like cylindipine. These are all safe medications to start with. And one can start with one of these medications. Earlier, there was a rule that you have to start with this medication, diuretics, then you step to this one. Now, we know that all these medications are equally effective and based on a patient's you know, various other factors, we make a decision which medicine we start. And usually these medicines at low doses have very few side effects. So any of these medications can be taken, but it has to be prescribed by a doctor. That's the most important thing. One Absolutely. cannot take it off the counter. Right, right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. There is a very interesting question now. It happens that in VLCC, we have uh, many ladies who are coming for weight loss. They are obese and uh, some of them are hypertensives also. And uh, they become pregnant. And uh, so as we know that uh, pregnancy with hypertension has many complications and it can harm uh, mother's kidneys and other organs. And it can also lead to premature delivery or low birth weight babies. So how, how do you, uh, what do you advise uh, and how do you manage a pregnant lady with hypertension? Okay, yeah, it's not so difficult. This has been a very old problem as old as the pregnancies are there. And the high blood pressure has been one of the major causes of issues occurring during pregnancy. And if we don't treat it well, the baby can get affected, the life of the you know, mother can get affected. So that is why I recommend that the blood pressure has to be checked for every pregnant woman on a regular basis. And this blood pressure, when it starts going up, is known as pregnancy-induced hypertension. And sometimes it can become so bad that, you know, uh, 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 people have to go for early surgeries like a cesarean section or, uh, you know, a premature birth and things like that. And the baby may not grow so well. So the blood pressure has to be checked regularly and has to be controlled with the help of medications. There are very simple medications available like, you know, Aldomet, like, you know, amlodipine, beta blockers. However, some of the medications cannot, should not be given to pregnant women and most of the doctors will actually know it. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, then we come uh, to elderly now. Uh, most of the, many of the elderly people like uh, have hypertension and they would have tried number of medications and over the years and even some people feel that uh, even when they're taking mild uh, medication, some people want to know that 
uh, is it possible to get rid of the medication if we if we try to do various other things like lifestyles uh, lifestyle management etc and elderly especially say about 60 years of age is there something very specific or special that we need to uh, do and what sort of advice do you give to them to elderly people yeah. for elderly people you know the advice is that you know they they are in fact more prone to developing complications of high blood pressure so their blood pressure should be checked very you know meticulously every you know 6 months or maybe once in a year and if the bp is high then it should be checked every month to see whether the medicines are effective or not and we have to give regular medicines to our patients elderly patients to keep everything under control and their symptoms will be much better if the blood pressure is controlled so the aim is to keep the blood pressure controlled okay whether yeah. it is dr chandra you have been muted please you are muted yeah so sorry suddenly thank it happened you. thank you thank you no worries okay. so basically what i was saying is that uh, the for the elderly the blood pressure has to be under kept under control and even if they are requiring medication no problem it's right. very medic medicines are simpler than having high blood pressure wonderful and uh, there is a question uh, which has come uh, there is a case of uh, young adult hypertensive and uh, has an early uh, renal derangement uh, so uh, what would be the course of management like when they yeah. So, yeah. so now here there are two problems. One is high blood pressure and the second is kidney problem. Right. So patients who have kidney problems, control of blood pressure is even more important and we have to keep blood pressure quite well controlled. If the blood pressure is not well controlled, the kidney de derangement will start very rapidly. And many right. times these patients have to go for a transplant or a dialysis, etc. very soon. So it is very, very important that their blood pressure should be checked very regularly and the medicine has to be tailored according to the blood pressure. It is not that, you know, you just give one dose and forget it. We have to right. check it and titrate the doses according to blood pressure on right. a very regular basis. Wonderful. Right. So uh, is it possible, doctor, that once you start taking the medication, it is for lifelong? Can it be... Uh, is it possible that uh, one can, uh, you know, just get rid of it by any methods like lifestyle or anything else? Yes. Yeah, it is possible. Many times it does happen. But as I said, one should try lifestyle measures to start with. One should not start medicines as the first step. Right. So if one does that, there will be 20% patients who will never need a medication. Right. But right. once those patients who are needing medications should not shy away. Right. from taking medications because medicines are not harmful. High blood pressure is more harmful. 10 times more harmful is high blood pressure than taking medicines. Right. Uh, Dr. Chandra, what happens if uh, somebody who has been taking uh, blood pressure medicine for so long, antihypertensives, and suddenly stops for some reason? What? what... Uh, you know, that's, that's again a not a good thing, but suddenly if you stop, the blood pressure can suddenly shoot up Sometimes if it shoots up so much, it can lead to a stroke or a heart you know, uh, ailment. Some kind of a heart attack can also happen at times. So one should not stop the medication suddenly because there right. will be a rebound hypertension. Suddenly right. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandra. That was really insightful and very useful. And thank you so much for your time and so generously sharing your uh, invaluable insights and advice around hypertension. I'm sure our attendees have benefited immensely from your interaction. And thank you once again. And uh, we don't want to keep you away from your OT. And thank you so thank much you. for giving us okay. the time. Really okay. honored. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, coming back to, uh, that is really interesting. And uh, so uh, coming back to uh, Dr. Bhatia again. Uh, so, so we left at uh, what were the symptoms and complications. So Dr. Bhatia, many people are asking at what BP reading should we actually start the treatment? 
So Anju, that's a very, very important uh, question that when do we start treatment? Do we, so, you know, there is, there's some very important thing which I will describe to our viewers. Uh, you have a, you know, a patient who comes into a hospital, right? And he goes for his blood pressure check. Maybe he doesn't know he has blood pressure. The right. doctor checks his blood pressure, puts the cuff on, and then, you know, vigorously moves his head from side to side. And he says, your blood pressure is high. And the poor patient has tons of anxiety, tons of anxiety. And then he says, oh, uh, okay. The doctor says, okay, like Dr. Praveen Chandra was saying, not one reading is not enough. We need a right figure, you know, the correct figure. So he says, come back in a week's time. So you go back home, you read Dr. Google, the Google tells you a lot of things about the symptoms. Somebody saying just repeat some of the symptoms, which are from, you know, like you can have a stroke, you can have severe headaches, you can have bleeding from the nose, you can have heart attack, kidney failure, dialysis. So he comes back in a week's time, even more stressed out. So his blood pressure is even higher. So in the old days, we used to always go by checking the, the blood pressure in hospital because these meters of ours, electronic, were not very reliable. So we used to always cough at them. But now the way science and technology has moved, the latest is the best way to get your figure is to get your blood pressure checked at home. So your answer is to your question, first get the right figure. And one way to get the right figure is, I would tell the patient buy a good machine like an Omron or whichever, which is one of the top ones in the market and check your blood pressure at different times. Take it in morning, take it in the evening, make a, a diary, blood pressure diary you call it, Bring me 10, 20 readings, and then I'll make a decision. So firstly, you have to have this right, number one. Number two, even better than this, when there are fluctuations, is a 24-hour 24 24-hour 24 ambulatory BP mon monitor, which I'll just show you. 24 hours BP monitor, which is ambulatory. So you come to the clinic or to the hospital, they put this onto your arm, and they adjust it for daytime, every half an hour reading, at night, every one hour reading. And believe me, it doesn't disturb your sleep. And then you have a true figure. They take an average out and you have a true figure. So this way, this way you're getting a true figure and then you decide whether treatment has to be started or not. Number two, see the reversible factors. Okay? Like he was saying, Dr. Chandra, somebody smoking, tobacco, chewing, alcohol, stress, you know, type A personality, whatever it is. Uh, he's on too much medication, taking too many painkillers. Maybe he's got sleep apnea. He's snoring a lot. Very, very big reason is this. We've had patients come to our clinic whose blood pressure has gone through the roof and they keep going from doctor to doctor. They've tried Swami Ramdev, they've tried Ayurveda, they've tried everything. Nothing's working and they've missed the cause. The cause is heavy snoring and, you know, gaps. So when you have apneic spells, your oxygen drops. So the stress hormones release and they just you know, like a volcano, take your blood pressure up. So you, you know, find out these. So I would firstly not start the pill. I would look for reversible causes. I would look for the right blood pressure reading, the average, the number is very important. Then I would decide. Now a last comment, very, very important. A person may have a blood pressure of 150 by 100. I may not start him on treatment you know, 150 by 96 or something, I would still give him a chance, tell him to cut down his salt, tell him to exercise, tell him to do some pranayam, tell him to take life easy, cut down some medicines he's hooked on to, or tobacco or alcohol. I would wait in that situation. And, but if a person comes with even low blood pressure, let's say 134 by 94, right? Dr. Chandra was just saying, and we were all discussing over 134, 94, we should start treatment. Now, at that reading, if he has got some complication, right? Like what he has albumin in the urine, kidneys getting affected, I will start treatment at a lower blood pressure. If I get his fundus eye examination done, you know, I look right inside the retina and I find this one hemorrhagic spot called hypertensive retinopathy, I will start treatment. I would do an echo and I find that the heart is thickening because the heart has to pump more. So it starts thickening after some time. I would start treatment. So it is the, so, you know, the, the whole lot of things before you really decide about treatment. Complications, yes. But reversible factors, you must, must take a look before one starts treatment. Okay. Right. I think right. that's your answer.
question. Yes, to... Dr. Bhatia, uh, yes, like, uh, like Dr. Bhatia said, it cannot be a one treatment for all. It has to be done Absolutely. case by case. We have to evaluate. We have to check the blood pressure properly and then go back. There is, a, a, there is doc, a doctor, there is a lady, Mandana Agarwal, and she is requested again and again, Dr. Bhatia, please, can you just quickly repeat the symptoms once again, a request? <laughs> So remember that when I'm, I'm going to repeat the symptoms, that's fine. But please keep this thing in mind that the symptoms overlap with other conditions. So don't take this message home that if I say headache is an important symptom, don't any headache you get doesn't mean it's hypertension. There can be many other causes. It can be from right. sinus, it can be ear problem, uh, eye problem. There can be thousands of problems. So, but yes, a pain in the ears, headache, a throbbing kind of pain, especially when you get up in the morning at the back of the neck, occiput, there you should definitely uh, keep in mind. Bleeding from the nose is another one, right? And then palpitations. Suddenly you feel your heart, you know, going, doop, doop. You, can, you can actually hear your heartbeat, right? So that's another one. Breathlessness. Suddenly you start getting breathlessness, which was not there earlier. You're climbing steps and you're getting breathless. And then you, oh, you're suddenly getting swelling of the feet. Or in the morning you wake up and you find that there is swelling around your eye. So these are important symptoms and signs. Or if you suddenly have some slurring or some weakness in one of your hands, you know, slurring of speech. So these symptoms are the ones then right. we, we must get the blood pressure checked. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia. And there is another question by Pallavi who says that if you have a single kidney by birth, uh, it can affect on heart health or have mm -hmm. one can have hypertension. Okay, good question. So a lot of my patients have a single kidney. So I'm doubly cautious when I give certain medicines. Certain antibiotics affect the kidney. So always check with your doctor. Certain painkillers affect your kidney. Certain antidepressants affect your kidney. So be careful. And also having said that, don't put strain on that kidney by having too much alcohol, which will dehydrate you. Similarly, if you have vomiting or nausea or diarrhea, be more aggressive in treating that. Don't do home remedies. Go to your doctor and straighten it out. Because if you get dehydrated, that one kidney, there'll be strain on it. Having said that, a single kidney is no, not a problem. I've had patients who live till 90 with a single kidney. No problem at all. They've done extremely well. Slight caution about like alcohol, slight ca caution about certain painkillers which can damage the kidney, and certain other things like dehydration. I would, I would be careful with that. Otherwise, really... It's not a problem. And time to time, get your renal function test done, especially your E, GFR, effective GF, G, uh, GFR stands for glomerular filtration rate. That's the latest. We'll pick up even the slightest problem in the kidney. Keep, keep that in mind. Thank yeah, you, Dr. Bhatia. Very interesting. So uh, coming back to uh, when uh, Dr. Chandra said it's best to, and you too said, it's best to take blood pressure at home. So what are the most common mis mistakes, you know, people make while measuring BP? Would you, uh, would you be able to show us, please? Yes. So uh, because I think the screen will be small, I'll, I'll firstly, let me roll up my shirt. Um, this thing is an uh, instrument which you can buy at any chemist. Omron is the one I use, there are many available, but it's a good brand. And a few things before you take your, your measurement at home, make sure that you for half an hour before that you've not had a smoke, you've not had alcohol, you've rested properly, you slept well the night before, and just before that you've not had a diuretic for your blood pressure if you're already a known hypertensive. So these are a few things you need to, and you're not stressed out. So you should be totally relaxed. Don't take it lying down. Those days are over when doctors used to say, lie down on the bed and we'll take it. No, you have to be sitting in a chair comfortably with your legs down and your hands should be on the table at right angles. I'll show this to you. There, you see, this is at right angles. It's not here, it's not down. The instrument is also at the same plane. At the same plane, the instrument is at the same plane as my arm, right? It's at the same plane as my arm. This is very important. Never ever do it over the shirt or over a sweater or over, over a jacket. I have seen this time and again. I walk into the emergency or into the cardiac units and I'm forever screaming at the junior doctors and the nurses that do not be in a hurry 
you know, because nowadays there's so much stress on them. Patient going coming in and out, in and out. I tell them, no, you have to keep it on skin, right? Then you roll this up. I'll again push this down so you guys can see. And there you can see my arm is bare. And the tube, tube is, is on the, away from the body. And the tube has to be on the inside. It has to be on the inside. Why? Because the brachial artery, the brachial artery travels inside. And that's what the sensor, this is a sensor here. That's what it's going to check. So we wrap it here wrap, and it should be nicely snugly wrapped. It should, so it's a very simple thing. It's a one finger test. So one finger should go in. If two, three fingers are going in, it means this is loose, one finger. This, the edge of the cuff should be one inch above this crease. This is the crease. It is one inch above, one inch above. So it should not be below. It should not be too high up. And this has to be at the same level. And then you take the measurements. If your arm is cold, you will get a wrong measurement. So your arm should be, especially in winter. So you should be, it should be like, I won't say warm, but it shouldn't be cold, right? So if your arm is cold, there'll be a problem. Also, you should keep in mind that the arm ones are the best, right? The Japs are famous in making everything miniature. So, so like Sony transistors, if you remember from the old days, do not go for rest BP machines. Do not go for finger ones because the arteries are very narrow here. The sensors are not so good as they are supposed to be. So please do not go for those. Go for the arm one, go for a good brand, keep it one inch above the crease, keep it, one finger should go in, right? It should be at the same level. You should be totally relaxed. And one more important thing, besides you should not have smoked for one hour, a half an hour, you should not have eaten for half an hour, you should not have had alcohol for another, uh, half an hour before. And another important thing is that your bladder should be empty. Your bladder should be empty. That's, that's another very important point. So if you do these, uh, your reading should be fairly accurate. Then we have a 24 hour. 24 hour instrument is like this. You see that? That's a 24 hour. This you can set for one hour every night, uh, every um, one hour at night and half an hour during the day. So this is the same thing as a simple cuff. The, you go to the clinic, you go to the hospital, they'll tie this on you. And this, this little chappy here, which is the which is the computer, is put inside this. You see, it's like it's just it's like a purse. You put it inside, and you can strap it around your waist. You can put it inside your shirt. You can walk around. Besides bathing, you can do everything under the sun. Then this, you you take this off later, send it back, and as you can see, there is a port here, USB port. This port it goes gets connected to my laptop, and all the readings. So many readings, they all come onto your laptop and there you see, the, there you get the correct figure. You know now if the figure is correct, it is not a wrong figure, which would be in hospital. Like I was telling you, the doctor will shake his head, you will read Google, you will get, right. you get a wrong reading, you will get a phone call, doctor gets a phone call, Are doc saab, wo to gir gaya. he's fallen in the bathroom because you've given, you've done, you know, you, you, you're not supposed to treat and you've treated. And the printouts come like this. I don't know the light's too strong. But the printouts come like this. And as you can see here, there is something which is falling at night. At night, that when it falls, it's called a nocturnal. Nocturnal means night. Nocturnal dip. That nocturnal dip is very important. If you have a nocturnal dip, you will not have a stroke. You'll not have a heart attack, usually, unless there are other risk factors. Unless you've been smoking yourself to death, that oh, you're very obese. But you can get a lot of readings like this, plenty of readings. So the pages and pages, the computer takes out a reading. I have taken out two important ones to show you. Uh, 24 hours, ambulatory, BP is a beautiful thing. You know, you walk around and you know what your BP is. A lot, very often people ask me, doc, I'm exercising a lot. Do you think my BP is shooting up? It might be, I don't know. So now I know because you know you have this 24 hours ambulatory BP recorder. So it's technology is something, and you can you can send this you know so so easy. This I can send to my patient on his on his smartphone, so it can just be transferred in minutes. So but data can be given, and and we we are accurate. We know what is happening, and that's that's it. Just to everybody. <laughs> right. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor Bhatia. This is so wonderful. So useful. 
and you have made it all so real for our viewers with your demonstration and actual device. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. Uh, and you know what? Uh, just just to reiterate what Dr. Bhatia has just said, because blood pressure normally rises and falls throughout the day. Since it varies, a single blood pressure reading is almost never considered as hypertension unless it is very, very high. So our blood pressure is typically higher in the morning and lower in the afternoon and evenings and is generally about, like Dr. Bhatia said, the nocturnal dip. At night, it is 10% to 20% lower during sleep. So, and also interestingly, blood pressure is generally higher in winter and lower in summer, but that's because low temperatures in winter, they cause our blood vessels to constrict or narrow, which increases the blood pressure. However, if in summer there is humidity, then your blood pressure may rise because, uh, you know, the heart has to beat uh, very, uh, very much faster to, you know, push the blood towards the skin by radiating heat because cooling becomes a problem with humidity. So that is one thing one has to be careful during summer and humidity, it might just shoot up. Now, there is a question from Pooja and she says that uh, what happens if the readings uh, in the right and the left arm are different? So uh, Pooja, the answer is that usually the reading of both arms is not the same. There is small difference in blood pressure readings between the arms. It, it isn't a cause for worry. However, if the difference is more than 10 mm of Hg for either the top number or the systolic or the diastolic, then it may be a sign of you know, peripheral uh, uh, circulatory disease or the blocked arteries in arms or diabetes or other health problems. That has to be checked. That investigations will have to be done for them if, if the difference is more than 10 mm of Hg. So... That's what uh, Dr. Bhatia also showed how, uh, you know, one has to sit and take uh, the blood pressure because uh, the, the position matters, you know, it drop, it, uh, the blood pressure tends to drop when you're standing normally compared to sitting and lying down and uh, sitting blood pressure is generally the best. And like Dr. Bhatia said, when sitting, rest in a chair next to a table for five to 10 minutes, relax and arm resting comfortably at your heart level. So that was Dr. Bhatia. And now going forward, uh, again, diet, exercise, de-stressing and other healthy lifestyle measures have very, very significant impact on our well-being, right? So let's see now how diet may impact hypertension. And to help us understand that, I'm pleased now to introduce our third panelist, Dr. Deepti Varma, who with over 25 years in the field of nutrition and dietetics, currently heads nutrition at VLCC Skill Development. And uh, she has been a lecturer, a medical nutrition consultant, writer and editor. And she has been fel felicitated with several awards for her contribution to nutrition, including a Lifetime Achievement Award in September 2019. So welcome to webinar, Dr. Ditti. Pleasure having you, as always. So thank you so much, Dr. Gai. In fact, very good afternoon to you and to all the participants. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so let's get on with the questions. A lot of them coming in. So this, the first one, of course, is that what are the main dietary recommendations you would like to offer to our viewers for those suffering from hypertension? Yeah, so actually, this is the era where we have a lot of sodium in our diets. You know, we don't even realize the amount of sodium that we consume. You know, the normal values of the sodium that we should be consuming normally is about uh, 1,500 to about 2,300 milligrams. Whereas the consumption goes over uh, 3,000, you know, where because, because of the excessive consumption of the processed foods. So to begin with the first and the foremost, I'd like to actually mention is that if somebody is overweight or obese, one needs to lose weight because obesity is one of the major most triggering factors for hypertension. 
So, of course, if you're finding it difficult to lose weight or to consult a clinical dietitian, please get in touch with any of your nearest VLCC centers. And I'm sure that a good clinical dietitian is going to help you out with it. So, losing weight is mandatory. And then another thing is, so uh, there is a specific kind of a diet in nutrition that we call as DASH diets. That is D-A-S-H, which is like dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So which actually entails some key things. So I'd like to name them for you. So the first one, of course, is to consume the whole grain cereals because this is something which is always compromised. I see, you know, people normally consuming a lot of food which is made in maida or refined flour. So that's definitely totally devoid of uh, uh, the fiber content. So taking whole grain cereals uh, in all the meals is mandatory if one suffers from hypertension. Um, uh, besides, one needs to consume an additional dose of fruits and vegetables because that's again going down. I mean, the children today, they don't like the green leafy vegetables or they don't like the normal vegetables. They don't like, you know, fiber pulses. So then the fiber content again goes down. So it's very, very important for us to actually consume fruits and vegetables and uh, not just because of the fiber reasons, but also because they are very, very rich in potassium. And potassium actually is hugely instrumental in managing the blood pressure because it exerts the opposite effect of the sodium. So yeah. that is, of course, the reason. Yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, your voice is slightly breaking. If you could come near the okay the microphone, please. Thank All right. you. Right. I'll try that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is it any better? Yeah. Yeah. Much better. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so uh, this was the thing. And then uh, over and above this, very important for one, uh, you know, one needs to consume a vegetarian source of proteins. Also because we do not want to overload your kidneys because hypertension is so related to renal disorders as well. So obviously, you know, the blood pressure by and large gets maintained through the kidneys uh, in the nephrons. So in order to actually safeguard the nephrons in the renal health, it is very important for us to, uh, you know, like not take a very rich protein diet that normally people do that actually comes in from the animal protein. So hence it is advised to stick on to the vegetarian sources of proteins uh, till the time the hypertension doesn't get controlled. And uh, then other than this, of course, uh, salt is something I'd especially like to say because the table salt is uh, actually very rich in sodium. So as I mentioned that the normal salt values, sodium values that we give to, uh, you know, um, under normal circumstances are 1500 to 2300. In fact, they should be a little below 2000, which is equivalent to about three to four grams of sodium chloride on the table salt that we have, which is like the tiny spoon, which we call as a teaspoon. So this is, uh, uh, you know, say three fourths of a teaspoon. About yeah, three, so three, uh, sorry to interrupt again. Yeah. So there's a question like, uh, what about the Sinda Namak or the salt, Himalayan salt? Is it healthy for hypertensives? Oh, well, absolutely. They're healthy. I mean, if, if that's the question that people normally need to know, there's so many questions, you know, like these kind of questions coming into me that, you know, should we take the pink salt and it's actually very good for health or should we take the Sinda Namak because that's, again, something which is very organic. So, but then I just like to say that, uh, yeah, the normal table salt that we normally consume for our everyday cooking is iodized and iodine becomes a very important component of the thyroid hormone because basically iodine earlier used to be there in our table water, which, you know, through the water, through the roots, it was transported to every part of the plant and we'd, we'd have enough of it. But with the passage of time, iodine levels have kind of really fallen down and only source, you know, by and by, the primary source of iodine now becomes the common salt, uh, which is iodized because our government uh, of India has made it mandatory for all the, you know, salt that uh, the table salt that reaches every household has to be iodized. And iodine is an important component of the thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone actually is called iodothyronine, you know, triiodothyronine. So right. it is a constituent of the thyroid hormone. Otherwise, one becomes deficient in uh, the thyroid hormone. As it is, a country is actually, you know, suffering from a lot of cases of hypothyroidism. So, yeah, I mean, I would anytime advise one to take the normal common soil that we get in the market only because of its iodine content. Okay. So, so, yeah. so just to reiterate uh, for everyone, mm -hmm. 
uh, Dr. Deepni has just said that, uh, yes, we have to reduce the sodium consumption and the ideal uh, consumption rate is uh, almost a small teaspoon, which is around four grams of uh, normal salt. Now, uh, it was asked whether Sendha Namak is healthy. It is healthy, yes. But uh, since our normal salt uh, is iodized, which is very important for our thyroid uh, health, so one needs to take uh, that, but at least, uh, I, I mean, have to be careful with the amount, right, uh, Dr. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Deepti, there's another uh, question. Uh, when, uh, when a person has hypertension, can they have uh, milk, uh, toned and skimmed milk freely? Because generally they are told not to by, by many, right? Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to the milk consumption, basically, you know, we have a milk coming in three categories, broad categories. The first one is skim milk that contains about 0.5 to 1% of fat. Then we have toned oblique cow's milk that almost comes in the same category, which gives us about 2 to 3% of fat. And then comes the buffalo milk, oblique full cream milk, which contains about 18 to 22% of fat, which is extremely steep. So uh, most of the hypertensive patients, basically, uh, they actually are also, you know, like they may have the other CVD problems as well, the cardiovascular related problems like high cholesterol and a low HDL or a high LDL. So we also kind of control the saturated fatty acids. So that way, buffalo milk or full cream milk is totally out of the option. And now coming into the toned milk, of course, like milk per se is high on sodium. So again, in order to actually control the amount of sodium, we need to actually bring down the consumption of the milk. Uh, again, basis the degree of hypertension in the patient. And it's not just about milk. Of course, we would be controlling the milk. Also, very important to take care of some other factors, uh, you know, which we need to actually stop having totally. Uh, and that includes the processed foods. Uh, the processed foods, as in uh, the ketchups, the soya sauce, uh, the dips that come in the market, uh, the pickles in the market. So they all are loaded with the preservative known as sodium nitrate, which again, that sodium part of the sodium nitrate becomes very lethal for a person who's hypertensive. Uh, then uh, the other way, you know, one gets sodium is through the Chinese food and all the Chinese food in the market, most of it, and all the other foods as well, you know, that we buy from the shops. Uh, on from the uh, restaurants. So they all are, uh, you know, they contain um, uh, Ajinomoto, which is again, mono sodium glutamate. So again, that contains sodium because it's a taste enhancer, which is used in the food that we actually take in from outside. And um, uh, so, and then in the big, big products again, so all the baked products, you know, would have the baking soda in them, which is called sodium bicarbonate. So that again is the sodium, which is not great for the body at all. And definitely not for a person suffering from hypertension. So we would definitely not give these three things. And in the vegetables category, the green leafy vegetables have to be eliminated from the diet if one has uncontrolled hypertension or a very high grade hypertension. Uh, like wow. spinach and amaranth. So these also are the things one needs to take care of. Wonderful. Yeah, that's really insightful, uh, Dr. Deepti. And I'm sure everyone has uh, gained out of this. And uh, so it's it's been, uh, it's, thank you for guiding us with healthy food choices and what is valuable for our health. Uh, so, uh, thank you once again, Dr. Deepthi. So, now let's turn to exercise and how, how it helps in hypertension. Now, exercise and being active is very important for our general well-being. We all know that. And actually, it helps hypertensives and obese patients to also lose weight. Now, just for the information, there are approximately 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our body. And these are very minute uh, blood vessels, capillaries, which are there in the muscles, which irrigate the muscles and they provide oxygen and nutrients to the muscles. And normally, at rest, they are in a collapsed state. 
and when you when you exercise and when you're active more than 50 times over will open up bringing down the blood pressure now uh, yes exercise is important but we have to take care of certain precautions now in a case of hypertension we should start with mild to moderate intensity exercises yes so uh, to go further uh, you, you one should have at least 60 minutes of low to moderate intensity aerobic exercise or cardio exercise on most of the days of the week and uh, you need not do it at one go you can break it up you can do uh, in two to three sessions 20 minutes to three sessions or 30 minutes two sessions uh, and uh, the, the result or the benefit is same as one session, actually. So you could go for brisk walking, you could do swimming, you could do slow jog, you could do cycling, treadmill, cross trainer, bike, dancing, etc. But remember, one should always do this with a warm up exercise before doing aerobic activity, one has to warm up and do not just get into uh, the, the active part of the exercise. Allow a few minutes also to cool down once you have done it because it brings down your heart rate to normal within five to 10 minutes. Listen to your body. Actually, when it, it, it varies from person to person, listen to your body. When you feel your heart is racing or you find you're getting too tired very quickly, stop immediately and take rest. The thing is that one has to avoid being sedentary, take breaks from sitting, move and walk around as much as possible because being sedentary and sitting too much is linked to an increased risk of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and even sometimes some, some types of cancer. So uh, the thing is never lose an opportunity to get up and walk whenever you can. Now, Adding muscle helps burn more calories when we exercise. So add at least 15 minutes of resistance training, also called as strength training to build muscle mass. Now, you may use exercise machines in the gym, free weights, dumbbells, resistance band, or your own body weight, um, like squats, planks, arms, and leg strengthening exercises, maybe 15 minutes every day or 30 minutes twice in a week. Yoga and Tai Chi, though very gentle, also fall in this group. Now, but some precautions have to be taken when you are doing this uh, machines, you know. So avoid overhead movements like lat pull, you're pulling it hard. Know, take care of that and even when you do free weight exercising exercises using overweight overhead movements uh, have to be avoided or you know there should be slow uh, transition from one position to another that may be like from standing to lying down or sitting to lying down and more importantly when you're doing this ensure uh, regular breathing, like no holding the breath during uh, the exercise. Because sometimes when we are so much into the exercise, we keep holding our breath and, and that may, you know, affect uh, the blood pressure. So more importantly, I feel that if, if your blood pressure is under control, you can do all the exercises, but, you know, go slow from mild to moderate as your endurance increases. And if you have the bumps, like if you have uh, uh, the blood pressure rising off and on, then you have to be careful, do it under supervision. And more importantly, look for signs during exercise that indicate that there is an emergency kind of a situation, like if you have chest pain or you have headache and you have shortness of breath or you feel dizzy or you have certain visual changes or you're sweating continuously and you have nausea and there is severe anxiety or sudden severe fatigue, then, then don't wait. It is an emergency, take action, just go to uh, the nearby doctor or hospital. Do not wait. It may be, you know, very serious. Right. So um, in the end, let me summarize the key takeaway for you. Hypertension is called the silent killer because it doesn't usually have identifiable 
you know, symptoms. Sometimes you don't have any symptoms at all. So it's important to get your blood pressure checked uh, yearly during your yearly physicals and, uh, you know, medical checks because severe hypertension can cause serious health issues. Now, most cases of hypertension don't have a cause. So it may be inherited or related to your diet, sedentary lifestyle. And also you should know that there is a slight increase as you age. So if you have risk factors like heart condition or diabetes, it's a good idea to monitor your blood pressure regularly and take preventive measures. Dr. Bhatia has shown you how it has to be done. And if you need help, just get in touch with your doctor. Right. Often, you know, lifestyle changes can greatly improve your chances of avoiding any hypertension medications and complications. Dr. Chandra said uh, that that the first line of treatment is your lifestyle change. Uh, so if lifestyle changes are, are not enough, then you have variety of prescription medication that can treat your hypertension. You need to get in touch with your doctor. It has to be evaluated properly. Now, recent studies also show that high blood pressure is linked to, you know, higher risk of dementia later in life. So the sooner you have it diagnosed, the sooner it can be managed and possibly even reverse. So the good news is that in many cases of hypertension, like we said, lifestyle changes are the powerful tools for, you know, managing and even reversing your diagnosis. And uh, to reiterate, eat healthy diet, reduce your salt consumption, maintain a healthy weight, get enough physical activity, no smoking at all, and limited alcohol use. And if you can avoid it, good. Practice stress relief techniques like meditation, yoga, or even visualization, you know, just thinking about good things. Because, you know, stress worsens the problem. So don't let it creep into your life as best as you can. Fill your life with friendship, with family, with pets, with laughter and love. Because real relationships are the best support for lifelong healthy life. And finally, don't forget, keep smiling, feel good about yourself. You are special, right? So, what Anju, what Anju, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, um, I think some of them will feel very bad if you don't answer the questions. If you have right. five, and some yes. of them are very really worried about their parents, and so I'll I'll just take some of the medical questions quickly. Very right? nice, doctor. Yes. So, uh, Ria Arora writes. My mother is on a medication since four years. Do does she need to change medication? Because sometimes her BP shoots to one fifty. Now you know a lot of people have this thing that this old medicine is not working. It is not so. Believe me, old is gold. If it's suiting an elderly lady doing well, don't touch it. Look at other factors like Dr. Anju just said. Look at the coffee. Look at the tea. Look at her sleeping pattern. Find out if she has sleep apnea. Look at the anxiety. You know, otherwise get her a, a good yoga teacher who will just do relaxation techniques, not Kapal Bharti. You know, do things like which are very simple and relaxing. 150 systolic is not alarming. We'll go to the next question. My father-in-law got admitted due to nose bleeding. This is from Palvi in because of high blood pressure. And it was so severe that a small surgery was done. Uh, it happens once in a while. So Palvi, all I can tell you is I've showed you how to record the blood pressure Please make sure that you have a good monitor. Do the recording properly yourself. Uh, you know, do it as often as you can. For both for Ria's mom and for Palvi's dad, one thing I want to say: all my patients, you know, when they land up the hypertensive, they land up in uh, peak winters in December, January, because that's the time it shoots up. Because the arteries go into spasm, and the peripheral arteries, and also because no sweating, so the salt stays in and the blood pressure shoots up. Then they again come back to me in March, uh, April, when you know they start sweating and then they, they lose salt. And uh, at that point of time, they'll come back and say, oh doc, uh, we are feeling dizzy. So that's what I tell them that be careful in peak winters and when the weather changes, because these are two times you need to monitor very, very carefully. Uh, Deepak writes, what are cardiac arrhythmias? Cardiac arrhythmias is a very broad term for misbeats. They are, they're good, you know, there's some which are not harmful uh, and some which are harmful. So for that, we usually do an ECG or a halter 
and then we decide about treatment. Ritu Khanna writes that blood pressure is falling to 80 by 60 or even 72 by 43, which is very low, uh, which is true, less than 90 and 60 is, you know, 72, 43, one reading, don't worry, you need multiple readings. But remember one thing, low blood pressure, best treatment is increase your salt intake. You're the lucky one. You, you cannot go, you didn't go by what Dr. Anju and Dr. Bhatia are saying. You have as much of soup and as much of salt and papad and a char and chutneys, you'll do fine. Uh -huh. Nothing to worry about. Okay, yeah. so fine. Uh, what is the range of hypertension for 65 year old? Latest is all ages, keep your blood pressure down. Previously it was for, you know, 10 millimeters for every 10 years has changed now. Now the latest concept is, Keep it down, keep it down as two normal levels for everybody. It's normal levels for everybody, okay? And uh, I think just one or two more, what is mitral regurgitation and left ventricular hypertrophy? This we're not going to because this is a valvular heart disease. Today we are discussing hypertension. It's very simple, I could give you the answer, but I think not at the moment. Very important question. Uh, in today's day and time, does smartwatch show correct readings? No, it does not. I just attended a very good meeting with uh, Cleveland Clinics. And they said that even the Apple Watch, it has not come of age. It's getting there, but don't. And I have a lot of patients who have troubled me in the middle of the night and said, Doc, our blood pressure is so much. Or we're getting atrial fibrillation, which means, you know, missed beats and 30% of your heart is not working in atrial fibrillation. It's a common complication of hypertension. So they'll tell me this and I'll, and I'll tell them, let me sleep. Come in the morning, I'll check your blood pressure. I'm very confident it's not high. And sure enough, it'll be normal. All right. So Koman asked that question. Good question, but don't go by that. And you want yeah. to take more? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia. Uh, Dr. Deepti, there are two questions for you. One is, what is the effect of tea and coffee on uh, blood pressure? And uh, also, does uh, sugar consumption uh, has to be curtailed in uh, hypertension? Okay, yeah. And then I read one more, which was to do with the fats, that how much fat should be consumed per day. Right, so, right, okay, right. So let me just quickly answer. So the first one was that uh, about... Uh, so the first one is about caffeine, tea and coffee. At the caffeine, okay. So caffeine is an instant stimulation. I mean, it gives you an instant stimulation. So obviously it is going to elevate the hypertension for sure. So caffeine uh, is better to be kept very, very low. Don't cook a brew. Like in India, we brew our tea so much. You know, we keep cooking it and we put it on the gas for a very long time, you know, so that it, it gets the uh, best flavor. And that is the kind of tea we like. But no, that is also extracting a lot of caffeine from the tea and coffee. So please uh, do not brew your tea too much and uh, uh, keep, uh, you know, uh, the milk minimum in that. Sugar has to be very, very low in the tea. And then you can consume about one tea a day, nothing more than that. Or you can split that one tea into half a month, half a month, morning and evening. That works. But if it is an uncontrolled hypertension, then uh, one would need to eliminate uh, uh, the second tea altogether and just have half a cup of tea in the morning only because people are so addicted to it. But then if you can get rid of it, nothing like it. That is going to be the best because caffeine in any way is not that great for the body. And yes, it does increase hypertension. And uh, the second one was about, about sugar. sugar, yeah, sugar consumption. So yes, yeah, sugar consumption, actually, I'd say that, you know, uh, all the heart related or blood related issues like hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disorders and diabetes, they are all twin brothers and sisters. Uh, they don't live without each other, you know. So if one has hypertension, definitely like, you know, it might uh, also be the person, the patient must be having a diabetes as well, which is type two diabetes. So yes, one needs to keep the sugar levels low because when the sugar levels actually increase in the blood, which is actually diabetes mellitus, um, that again increases the, the you know viscosity of the blood and that might trigger even a severe case of hypertension. So yes, sugar, white sugar anyhow is a processed uh, food, you know, so it should be kept at its minimum. And um, uh, so again, depending upon the severity of the hypertension, we may just not be able to give anything more than one teaspoon of uh, white sugar per day. Uh, and um, of course you can continue giving a little bit of the jaggery powder uh, or the uh, a date sugar in very minimal amounts. Yeah. Right. So uh, the, the third question was on healthy oils. Healthy oils, okay. So yes, saturated fatty acids are uh, not to be given to a patient with hypertension. 
so we have to stick on to the oil so the technical definition of the saturated fatty acids fat saturated fats are that at the temperature of 20 degrees celsius and above they solid i mean they remain liquid and below 20 degree they solidify so we have to avoid taking all those uh, kind of fats however you can continue taking your mustard oil or the soya bean oil but the upper limit i would like to uh, you know uh, prescribe for a patient with hypertension is uh, 3 to 4 teaspoons per day in fact even 4 is an exaggerated uh, value so stick on to 3 teaspoons per day right wonderful last question for you dr deepthi uh, to share some functional foods to keep uh, which helps uh, uh, you know take care of blood pressure Okay, so the first functional food that I'd recommend is garlic. Garlic is very hard, healthy food, and but that has to be taken the first thing in the morning. So how do we take the garlic? Is uh, you have to crush the garlic. Uh, take two pods of garlic, two tiny pods of garlic. Smaller the better because they would have the phytochemical called uh, allylane or allylic sulfide. Uh, so uh, crush the garlic outside and then put it in the mouth and then you have to chew it thoroughly and take it down. I've seen people take it like a pill, you know, like. like that garlic which whole garlic put into the mouth and it's gone right. down with water that is not the way to take garlic uh, it has to be opened up you know expose the garlic crush it well and then chew it well so those two garlic and you'll see a difference happening to you um, in a month's time provided you also follow a good lifestyle that has to be accompanied along with taking the garlic so that's like uh, uh, the first thing and of course like taking um, uh, you know the functional food is uh, uh tender coconut water which is very very rich source of potassium uh so that definitely helps so one can take one tender coconut per day uh if somebody has uh, hypertension which is like uncontrolled again and if you have controlled hypertension but on medication uh restrict uh, tender coconut to about 3 to 4 per week so you can skip a day and then have it like alternate days because of its high potassium values uh banana of course is very very rich in potassium so again like empty stomach when we give two bananas for breakfast uh would actually be very good for a patient with hypertension in fact when people with normal hypertension when they take two bananas for breakfast actually the blood pressure falls down drastically they become hypotensive so it's that good in actually you know immediately giving the effect uh, to the blood pressure so these are the three primary foods and of course nimbu pani lemon is very very good in potassium so you can have about two nimbu panis in a day and it has to be plain no salt no sugar in them it has to be only lemon juice half a lemon with a glass of water about 200 to 250 ml of water twice in a day so these are the primary foods uh, that would really help uh, take care of hypertension yeah wonderful wonderful i'm everybody has enjoyed the session dr anju since there should be no confusion because they are asking can we manage with just uh, nutrition and food to control blood pressure so the answer is for mild cases food has huge value all what dr dipti said was actually really very very important and good uh, from bananas to garlic and you know but uh, just want to say one thing that this is all for mild cases and even if it's moderate to severe still do it because your amount of medication will become less so right. oh by what she said is very important uh, i'm all for this but uh, i don't want them to take the message home that it's going to replace pharmaceuticals in moderate to severe cases because there it will not and then you land up with a complication and we kept saying in the beginning it's a silent killer so we need to be careful one last comment they said uh, one question was which was that uh, this lady has systolic normal and diastolic high now as of today both systolic and diastolic are important so even if one is normal and the other is high it has to be treated so and you know as you grow older like especially when you cross 60 65 you have systolic hypertension because the arteries you know they become narrow and thicker and you need to treat that as well okay so uh, it's not that you just treat diastolic or systolic everything has to be treated and everything has to be brought down to normal levels i think one last question somebody is again gunning for uh, dr dipti so she can take that question and then we'll wrap it up thank you okay thank you yeah. thank you dr mathi as dr mathi has said the med- medication will be tapering if you really take care of your diet yes. lifestyle so it gets tapered 
Right, right, right. So, uh, if it is mild hypertension, uh, we may avoid medication, but diet, exercise, de-stressing, being cheerful, staying away from the stress is very, very important. But when required, medication has to be taken, evaluated properly. It has to be taken regularly because if you just stop suddenly one day, you will have rebound increase uh, in the blood pressure, which which can be very, very dangerous. Right. So thank you all. Thank you so much. And uh, to reiterate at VLCC, our focus is on combined benefit of managing diet, activity and lifestyle to keep our clients healthy and well for life. And that's why our team of doctors, physiotherapists, nutritionists and therapists and wellness counselors, we all work together on custom design regimes for each and every client to help them achieve their wellness goal and not just weight loss or centimeter loss, you know. So thank you all for attending our webinar and guiding our conversations with your wonderful questions. We had so many today. And thank you so much to our panelists. Dr. Praveen Chandra is left, but we had a wonderful session with him. Dr. Bhatia, Dr. Deepthi, and uh, for all the learnings today. And so, Dr. Guy, there's been a question which uh, quite a few people have given that um, can we get a recording of this webinar? So, yes. you know, like, yeah. So yes. It's just we, that we put it on, a fa on our Facebook uh, after about 8, 8 30 in the evening. You will be able to access it on our Facebook uh, page right. of uh, VLCC. I so, think you can see it. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so, all our webinars, uh, the current and the previous ones, are uh, there on our Facebook and YouTube and uh, one can just go there and check it out, right? And so we have, we, we really hope now that all of you have better understanding of hypertension, how to manage it yourself and uh, for anybody you know. And if you wish to know more, there is a VLCC center nearby where our team of experts are just waiting to meet you. So in the end, wishing you all a healthy life Feeling with uh, happiness and fulfillment and keep smiling. Good evening and bye. See you again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.